In this video, we're going to take a look at how we can ingest over four gigabytes of data from a web data source into a bronze lake house in fabric using a very familiar data factory experience. Let's crack on. So in the previous episode, I introduced this statistical data set, the price paid data that's available on the British government's website. And this gives us information about land and register uh, land and property purchases, uh, over the course of the last 28 years in England and Wales, and gives us a lot of data related to that. And we saw yesterday, there are two different, uh, uh files that it gives us here. It gives us a monthly file, which updates us every month with the updates from, uh, uh, kind of revisions to previous sets of data, but also the new, uh, uh, a new addition to the data from this month. There's also a full single file of the, all of the historical and current data. So that's just a snapshot of their database behind the scenes, so to speak, but it's all provided as easy to ingest CSV and, and text files. Now the data itself we saw yesterday, uh, is a mixture of kind of strings, numerical fields and date. So we've got a good variety of data types going on. Now, without further ado, let's look in, go into fabric. So I've actually created a fabric end to end demo workspace and I've, uh, pre prepared it with a, uh, a blank empty pipeline. So if I just go on that pipeline, you'll see that the multitasking, uh, opens up a tab down here on the, on the underneath the workspace. So any, any artifacts that you've got open within that workspace will show underneath here. There is currently a limitation where you can't open pipelines from different workspace in the multitasking view. So for now, you're just going to have to create different tabs. So anyway, I'm on a blank canvas here and you'll see that it's pretty much a normal data factory experience, but everything's been pivoted. So in Azure Synapse and Azure Data Factory, most of your activities would be on the left-hand side vertically. Now they're along the top horizontally but pretty much everything that you'd find in Synapse pipelines and Azure Data Factory would be here. So in the activities, the only one we really care about for this data ingestion today is the copy data activity, which actually gives us two options. So we can either just add the activity directly to the canvas and configure it there, or we can use the copy assistant, which if you're aware from Synapse Analytics and Azure Data Factory, it takes you through step-by-step -step of configuring a copy data activity. But I'm actually going to use, um, uh, the activity just as it is. So if I drag that up, I can get all of the bits of configuration for this co copy data activity. So the first thing I'm going to do is just give it a better name. So copy land registry data from website, for example, and the source that I'm going to use is an external source. It's, it's not living within my fabric tenant just yet. It will be after I copy it, but I need to connect to that website. So if I were to, you know, do this from scratch, I'd click new and HTTP I'd click on that continue. I'd put in the URL, which I found here. Uh, but it's actually realized that I've, I've configured this type of connection before. So instead of going through that again and re-authenticating, I'm just going to use that connection. So I've made a connection to that endpoint, um, and, uh, everything's ready for me to go. Now the connection type I'm going to use is just a HTTP request. And that's because I want to use this binary file format. So if all you care about is getting, uh, data from A to B, not putting any structure or schema around it, you just want to do a straight copy. Um, a binary copy will always be the fastest way of doing that. Now that means I have to use HTTP rather than rest because rest, um, kind of implies some structure with how you, how you're able to configure it in, in data factory. Now the relative URL is actually only that base URL plus the name of the file, which in this instance is pp completecsv and that's actually the name of the file on the website. So you'll have to take my word for that. Now in the advanced, we don't actually care about any of these bits of configuration. We don't care about the request method. That's just going to default to get, which is what we want here. We don't need any additional headers or body. Now, in fact, let me test that connection and hopefully everything's connected correctly. Yep. That's fine. So if then 
we go onto the destination. And the destination, we want to be a lake house. We want to have a, a lake house that represents our bronze layer or bronze zone, which you'll uh, remember from the first episode, hopefully. Uh, but this is where we just want to store our raw files of data. Now, I haven't created a lake house yet, so you get this familiar kind of creation experience that you are used to kind of in data factory land, but now we're creating a lake house. So if I click new, I can um, type in the name. I'm going to say uh, bronze uh, demo underscore land registry. So create that. Now we need to decide whether we're going to put it in a the tables folder or the files folder. So again, remember from the first episode, the lake houses are split into two sections, tables, which is where your managed uh, tables will end up and files, which is just an object store for whatever you want to put in there really. Um, now I don't want this to be a table. I don't care about it being a table. I just want to land the data into our data lake for now. So the file path, now this is slightly more interesting because again, in the raw zone, you tend to want things to be relatively discoverable. If you're going in there and you're troubleshooting or diagnosing an issue, you want to be able to find things based on kind of when they arrived, for example, and have bits of metadata incorporated into uh, that path. So I'm just going to copy over a couple of, um, a couple of expressions that I've got over here. And if you're putting in expressions, i.e. Uh, dynamic content, you're going to want to um, open up this dynamic editor, dynamic content editor here. And if I just press paste, so what I'm actually doing here is I'm still creating a raw directory within my uh, one lake within my file system. Uh, then I'm uh, kind of coming up with a convention. So everything's going to go under land registry, price paid data, and then I'm going to split by upload year where the upload year is actually generated dynamically from this UTC now function in uh, data factory. So if I go to UTC now, we can see that returns the current timestamp as a string. And one thing you can do is you can uh, put in uh, a format there so that it will only be returned in that string format. So that's where the folder path that I want. And then the file name, again, if I just copy this over, Oops, I want to do that in the dynamic content. So I'm just calling the file PP complete. And then again, UTC, using that UTC now, I'm actually adding a slightly longer timestamp. And usually in, when it comes to the file names, uh, I like to put a timestamp on it so that if you have kind of incremental loads in the future, you know exactly which files have arrived after or before other files. So if I hit OK on that again, that's, that's that configured. And now in the settings, there are a bunch of settings that you can configure here, but actually I'm just going to leave them as they are. Maybe once um, the the pricing and uh, the, the performance becomes more clear as the public preview progresses, you might want to be more careful about whether you select auto or not, because it might have implications on just how much compute is used. And if you don't need your pipelines to be running that quickly or you don't need to be the, to be hyper optimized then you can um you can just edit this to be able to actually specify a specific number and that starts from two but actually i'm just going to keep it on auto so really that should be it and if i now go to run save and run it has started that pipeline and I can see in the output tab, that's where it started and it's queued my pipeline. So in the meantime, let me just go and show you one I have done before, which is equivalent to this, but slightly more, um, uh, more logic in there. If I just open this in just press paid data from land registry, we see things are slightly different. So I've got this switcher at the start. And the idea here is, that our orchestrator pipeline is going to tell us um, what type uh, of ingestion it is, as in whether it is the uh, monthly or the complete file that we saw on, on the website earlier. And then it's going to give us some information about the latest month. 
Um, now, on the switch statement, the, the expression that we're switching on is actually that ingest type. So I want to be able to choose whether our, uh, uh, we ingest the single file or the monthly file. That would generally be the single file will just be on the first time unless we need to rectify some issues that we've had with the monthly files and we want to just overwrite everything. Uh, but going forward, generally, it's going to be the monthly file that we want to default to. And you can imagine that these have slightly different endpoints that we need to hit, so we need to parameterize that. So once we've parameterized that, the expression, that can either be complete or monthly. And in each case, we have, um, we've got a slightly different uh, configured copy activity. So the complete will look quite like what I've, uh, what I've just created on the other tab. Uh, let's look at the monthly. So if we go to the monthly, then this is configured as such. So we've got a source, which is a slightly different name. So it's this PP monthly update new version. Uh, still a binary. Everything else is still the same, apart from we call the file name monthly instead of complete. But otherwise, everything is identical. But that, that parameterization that you can also do in Synapse pipelines and as your data factory has come over to uh, fabric um, data factory so and that's really useful to have these metadata driven pipelines where you can change the behavior based on some parameters that you pass in so if we go over here now uh, that is finished it took two minutes to copy uh, over four gigabytes of data we can actually inspect the copy activity here well actually it's closer to five gigabytes so those um, labels on the website aren't quite accurate um, but we get a bunch of information here. We see it was queuing for eight seconds and then it started the transfer, started reading and started writing concurrently or simultaneously at the same time. Um, so last thing we want to do is just view our workspace again. So the, that lake house that I created on the fly in Data Factory, in the Data Factory destination, uh, has now appeared. But we've also got this SQL endpoint in this data set. We won't worry too much about that for now. There's actually uh, ongoing kind of feedback to the product group to maybe hide these or make these optional because currently they just get provisioned whenever you create a lake house. But the SQL endpoint is essentially a way of using T-SQL to query, uh, to read from your data that's in your tables in your lake house. At the moment, we've not got any tables in our lake house. We've only got files, so we don't really care about that. And the data set is a data set on top of your, your tables, a, an automatic data set on top of your tables that are in your lake house. Uh, but if we just go to the lake house now and, and browse that, let's see what we've got in there. So under tables, we have nothing. Uh, there's nothing that's showing under there, but under files, we have this um, uh, directory structure that we created on the fly earlier. So raw land registry, price paid data, upload year, and then we've got our data here. And actually, if we click on it, we get a nice speedy uh, preview of this. And it'll only preview 10, 10 megabytes. So it's not loading over well, almost 5 gigabytes to, uh, to the screen right now. It's just 10 megabytes so that you can have a quick glance at your data. So that's really it. Uh, we've seen how we can ingest data from a uh, from a web data source into a bronze lake house in this episode. In the next episode, we're going to see how we can utilize the new shortcut functionality in Fabric to access existing data that's already stored within an Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2 account in our Azure tenant. So that's it for this video. Please don't forget to like and subscribe to stay on top of all our future content. See you next time.